Part five of the birth of professional rugby league in Australia. Selections from the Sydney Morning Herald, nineteen hundred and seven to nineteen hundred and eight. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The first professional fixtures, seventeenth of August to twenty second of August, nineteen hundred and seven. Saturday, seventeenth August, nineteen hundred and seven. Rugby football, a new era. New Zealand versus New South Wales. A new era in rugby football will be opened in Australasia today when the New Zealand professional team to visit England and play in a series of matches with the Northern Counties will meet at the agricultural ground a 15 playing as New South Wales, though all come from the metropolitan area. This is the first open declaration for professionalism in rugby football in New South Wales. It is nearly half a century since the game was taken up seriously in New South Wales, and since then no one has ever been disqualified for professionalism. Public feeling has been much stirred during the past few months with respect to the new movement, and really, considering the age of amateur football, the public sympathy with the seceding players was surprising. The strongest opponents to professionalism admit there is hardship under the present amateur constitution, but there does not appear to be any way to amend it without breaking away from the English rugby union. Today's match should result in a victory for the New Zealand team. The movement here is too much in its infancy to admit of as good a selection as might be made when the grade competition is over. It was stated by one of the delegates to the Metropolitan Union on Thursday evening that 150 players were prepared to join the league, but many want to see the season out with their clubs. The Auckland contingent of the New Zealand team arrived last night. The following will represent New South Wales. Fullback, C. Headley, 11 stone, 8 pound. Three quarters, J. Stunts, 12 stone. E. Fry, 11 stone, 1 pound. H. Messenger, 12 stone. F. Cheadle, 10 stone, 7 pound. Halves, A. Rosenfelt, 11 stone 1 pound, and L. Dalpuget, 11 stone 6 pound. Forwards, H. Hamill, 12 stone 10 pounds, A. S. Hennessy, 12 stone 11 pounds, R. Mabel, 11 stone 9 pounds, P. Moyer, 14 stone 10 pounds, F. Pierce, 13 stone 6 pounds, H. Can, 12 stone 4 pounds, R. Graves, 12 stone, H. Brackenrig, 12 stone. The New Zealand team will be fullback, Turtle, three quarters, Wrigley Todd Rowe, five eighths, R. Wynyard, McGregor, halves, Kelly Tyne, forwards, Watkins, Mackerel, Cross, Wright, Byrne, Gilchrist, Pierce, emergencies, Gleason, Tyler, Trewarthen, and Lyle, touch judge, W. Johnson. The early match between Newtown and Sydney under Australian rules will begin at one thirty and last until about three thirty. Other matches. The organisers of the New South Wales League have received two offers from country towns to send down teams to meet the New Zealand second team on Wednesday next. Ladies will be admitted free to the matches on that day. There is a strong likelihood of a match between New South Wales and New Zealand being played in Melbourne on August 28th. The promoters are awaiting a wire from a Mr John Wren of Melbourne. The new league should well consider every possibility before closing with any one individual. A conference will be held between representatives of the New Zealand team to visit England and the New South Wales Rugby Football League. The Recall of Dobbs Legal Proceedings Rumoured In consequence of the telegram sent by Mr McQuaid, Secretary of the Balmain Club, calling upon the Balmain team to return to Sydney at once as a protest against the action of the New South Wales Rugby Union, two players, Craig and Ballaram, arrived in Sydney yesterday. Men will be sent to Lithgow, where the team plays today, to fill the vacancies. Coleman, who Mr W. J. Howe stated in yesterday's issue, would take Dobbs' place, denies that he is going. He has, however, no intention of playing other than amateur football. There is some talk about Dobbs taking legal proceedings. E. Courtney, who it was stated by Mr Logan, Secretary of the St George Club, had withdrawn from the movement, 
called at his office yesterday and stated emphatically that it was his intention to play with the league mr logan secretary of st george club made the statement headley also intends to play hickey of glebe and slater of newtown have decided to play for their clubs in the competition dr kent hughes on professionalism dr kent hughes who is manager of the victorian team of boxers now in sydney for the interstate championships in responding to the toast of the visitors yesterday referred to the present movement in football after stating that there was no intention on the part of the melbourne university to take up rugby he said that sport and money were two opposite terms the athlete who sold his services to a club would sell that club just as quickly when occasion required down in melbourne veiled professionalism went on in football and in his experience extending over, extending over the last fifteen years every one of those professionals had simply wasted his life they never did any good, and it was a great shame that any body of men should persuade an athlete to devote the best years of his life to professional football, unfitting himself for work in life. He thought it would ruin the whole of a man's subsequent career. Monday, 19th of August, 1907 Professional Football, New Zealand versus New South Wales Won by the visitors, by 12 points to 8 perfect weather conditions for spectator though a trifle warm for player and a crowd of twenty thousand representing nearly one thousand pounds were the conditions under which the new era in rugby football was opened in australasia by a match between the new zealand team to visit england and a new south wales fifteen at the agricultural ground the result was a win for new zealand by twelve points to eight the play created a good deal of enthusiasm from kick-off to full time it was always interesting the forwards on both sides shone well in every department the visitors having the advantage over the home team in cohesion pace and skill in footwork owing to the fact that both back divisions had little or no combined training there was a want of passing rushes better work will no doubt be exhibited in later engagements especially in view of the fact that four of the visiting team arrived only on friday evening after a heavy passage the men found the ground hard as their knees and elbows gave evidence teams new south wales fullback c headley three quarters j stunts e fry h messenger f cheadle halves a rosenfeld and l dalpuget forwards h hamill a s hennessy r mabel p moyer s pierce h can r graves and h brackenrig new zealand fullback s turtle three quarters e wrigley l e todd h rowe five eighths r winyard and d mcgregor halves a kelly and e tyne forwards e watkins w h mackerel t cross e wright c burn d gilchrist and pierce referee mr g boss new south wales won the toss and defended the paddington end play hovered about between the two twenty fives for a while new south wales were the first to start combined play the ball being handled by the halves and three quarters and travelling across the ground from one twenty five yard flag to the other but without any gain at all a few minutes later messenger called forth cheers for a clever run and kick in the visitors territory the new zealanders changed the scene of operations to the home twenty five where cheadle secured and short kicked to wrigley todd kicked for goal and a messenger rushed the ball back to half way twice in quick succession the visitors forced once as the result of a drop at goal by messenger at the centre the visitors showed a rather pretty piece of combined play the ball was heeled out and kelly started a movement in which the ball was handled by mcgregor and wrigley and the home twenty-five was reached here new south wales were penalised and turtle kicked for goal the home team forcing the game was fairly fast and there was a good deal of enthusiasm among the crowd who freely recognised the outstanding points of the game the feature of the play so far was the magnificent dribbling rushes of the visitors who time after time ran down the ground in rare style brushing the light blues aside as they went on their course 
a splendid dash by both sides worked up the enthusiasm of the crowd it ended with a penalty against the visitors and messenger from just inside the half-way made a capital effort at goal the kick just lacking sufficient weight to carry it over the bar new zealand rushed the ball out and a light blue elected to run instead of marking and a few home fumbles gave the visitors an opportunity from which they closed with a score wright and wrigley figured in a passing rush which ended in a try by the former turtill failed at goal new zealand three to nil several times the visitors were penalised both in the open and in the scrum but messenger's efforts at goal were unsuccessful though one kick taken from dead on the centre line was a remarkably good one a splendid burst was shown by cheadle who taking a quick throw-in from touch by messenger ran dodgingly to the visitors quarter a passing rush by wynyard and todd closed with a score by the last mentioned which wrigley failed to convert new zealand six to nil at the visitors twenty five opposite the goal the home team started a passing rush dalpuget opened the movement and passing to cheadle the last mentioned lost the ball close to the line but messenger coming along picked up and scored a try which the same player failed to convert the half-time whistle sounded on a lovely passing movement by graves mabel and fry the scores at the interval were new zealand six points to three second half shortly after the kick-off by hennessy wrigley fumbled the take and for the moment matters looked dangerous but from a quick recovery he returned into touch at centre at the visitors twenty five the ball went to cheadle and then to messenger who dropped at goal new zealand forcing the visitors working along the eastern wing got to the home twenty five where new south wales had a few anxious moments in defence the ball was kicked to wrigley who took a drop at goal new south wales forcing stunts brought down the house with a splendid breakaway and run to neutral territory and then messenger got in a capital line kick to the visitors twenty five the blue forwards came down the ground and got well into the visitors territory with a lovely combined rush headley was cheered on several occasions for smart gathering and kicking he each time finding the line with distinct advantage to his side in the midst of a smart dash at the new zealand twenty five messenger accepted a clever mark his own kick was blocked magnificently in less time than it takes to tell he again secured possession and though he had his guernsey torn off his back he shook himself clear of the tackle and found the line at the visitors twenty five amidst loud cheering a light blue rush closed with a force by the blacks and from the kick-out messenger marked and himself kicked unsuccessfully for goal for the first time for some minutes the all blacks got into the light blue territory where the offenders were penalised and mcgregor kicked unsuccessfully for goal the referee mr boss held control of the game right through though towards the end he was not satisfied with the way the ball was put into the scrum and put it in himself the blacks were now doing all the attacking todd gained applause for a catch and line kick and wrigley on the other side of the ground put in a good run until forced out within a few yards of the new south wales corner in a scrum close to the new south wales goal the ball went out to a light blue who speculated foolishly and wynyard marked right in front of the goal wrigley kicked the goal making the score new zealand nine to three messenger put in a brilliant run at the centre he secured possession in his own half and sprinted to the visitors twenty-five and centred todd was tackled before he could get in his return and in succeeding loose play the ball went towards the line and can picking up scored a try which messenger converted new zealand nine points to eight a good deal of enthusiasm was shown by the crowd over this successful play working the ball down to the home territory stunts failed to gather and cross securing he scored in a fairly good position wrigley failing at goal new zealand twelve points new south wales eight full time melbourne match uncertain owing to difficulties in connection with fitting in the proposed match in melbourne with the departure of the boat 
there appears to be little likelihood of the New Zealand versus New South Wales match being played there. Football Crisis Metropolitan Rugby League Proposed Compromise Messrs. L. G. Abrams, J. Clayton, J. Payton, P. F. McQuaid, J. Flanagan, J. Dickey, and several other delegates to the MRU, who are all staunch supporters of amateur rugby football, have signed the requisite notice for a special meeting of the MRU to be convened at once to consider the following motion, to be moved by Mr. L. G. Abrams, and seconded by Mr. J. Clayton. 1. That any playing member of a first-grade club, affiliated to this union, representing the state or the union, shall be allowed, upon the production of a certificate from his employer, his loss of wages during such time he shall be absent from his employment, which shall not exceed ten shillings per day. 2. Should any accident occur to any first-grade player, either in an interstate or a competition match, which necessitates his being unable to follow his occupation, he shall, upon the production of a certificate signed by a duly qualified medical man, stating that from such accident he is unable to resume his work, be allowed his loss of wages until such time that the medical adviser certifies that he is able to resume his work. 3. That any playing member of a first-grade club affiliated to this union, representing either the state or this union, shall be allowed the sum of five shillings per day for personal or out-of-pocket expenses, in addition to his loss of wages. It is stated that some three years ago, an effort to carry similar motions was defeated. It is quite on the cards that some similar propositions to the above may be submitted to the meeting of the New South Wales Rugby Union tonight. Against the Constitution At present it is deemed an act of professionalism to receive compensation for time lost in playing football or in travelling in connection with football. To amend this it will be necessary to get the authority for the amendment from the English Rugby Union, or cut adrift from that body. Tuesday 20th of August 1907 The Football Crisis New South Wales Rugby Union Meeting of the Council Metropolitan Union to deal with professionalism A meeting of the Council of the New South Wales Rugby Union was held last night, Mr. J. F. McManamy presiding. It was anticipated that the Council would have taken some decided step to deal with those players who met the New Zealand professional team last Saturday, but the Union contented itself with delegating its powers regarding the laws of professionalism to the Metropolitan Branch to take action and report to the Union. The laws of professionalism, it might be pointed out, are controlled by the English Rugby Union, which delegates such powers to the New Zealand and New South Wales unions and the South African Board to carry out its regulations, and they in turn have been given the right to delegate such powers to other bodies in New Zealand, New South Wales and South Africa, respectively. Support for the League Spreading Morpeth and Singleton Speaking to the toast of the visiting team, Singleton, at a banquet given by the Morpeth Football Club at Morpeth on Saturday evening, the Mayor, Alderman J. Nogan, an old New Zealander, and a few years ago captain of the Morpeth Football Club, referred to the new rugby football era upon which New South Wales had entered. He said that he was an ardent admirer of clean sport, and knowing something of the manner in which the amateur cricketers of the state were monetarily treated when on tour, he undertook to say that the objective of the new league was more in the direction of placing footballers upon a parity in that respect than from ideas of becoming rich themselves at the expense of the players if he was not greatly mistaken the league flag would be floating over five-eighths of the rugby grounds of the state two years hence the initiation was in clean hands and he was certain the public would get clean football and the interests of those providing it would be fully conserved mr nogan's remarks were applauded and were supported by mr fawcett captain of the singleton team and by mr john gillis m l a professional rugby new zealand versus new south wales tomorrow's match the second match between the new zealand professional team to visit england and new south wales will be played on the agricultural ground tomorrow 
owing to the non-arrival of Wynyard, G. Smith and Dunning, who left Auckland last night, and also to the fact that several of the visitors were knocked about on the hard ground on Saturday, it has been found impossible to place two New Zealand teams in the field tomorrow. The early match will be between Marrickville Borough and McKill Race Club. We have been requested to state that ladies will not be admitted free, as was stated. The proposed contest between the New South Wales team which visited Western Australia and another New South Wales 15 has been abandoned. The country players had to get away home. Wednesday, 21st of August, 1907 Professional Rugby, New South Wales versus New Zealand, today's match the second of the three contests arranged between the New Zealand professional team to visit England and New South Wales will be played today on the agricultural ground. The first match was in every way a success. No fewer than 20,000 people, representing almost £1,000, being present. That engagement was won by New Zealand after a keen and interesting struggle by 12 points to 8, and another good game may be expected today. There is some doubt about stunts taking part owing to a bad ankle. An early match will be played between a Marrickville team and McGillwraith's club. Thursday, 22nd of August, 1907. Professional Rugby. New Zealand versus New South Wales. Easy win for visitors. A cold westerly, which considerably interfered with the game, prevailed yesterday afternoon when the second match between the New South Wales and New Zealand professional teams took place. The attendance was just short of 4,000. The home team were completely outplayed and were beaten by 19 points to 5. There was a vast difference in the play of the two sides. All the same, had New South Wales seized opportunities, the defeat would not have been so pronounced. Taking the game by and large, the home team put up a very weak contest. Teams, New Zealand, fullback, L. S. Turtle, three quarters, L. Todd, H. Rowe, D. McGregor, five eighths, E. Wrigley and R. Wynyard, halfbacks, J. Gleason and W. Tyler, forwards, R. Wright, T. Cross, W. Mackerel, A. Callum, W. Trewarthen, A. Little, W. Johnson, New South Wales, fullback, E. Fry, three quarters, W. Can, H. Messenger, F. Cheadle, A. Devereux, Halves, D. Brown and A. Holloway, Forwards, S. Pierce, H. Glanville, A. S. Hennessy, R. Mabel, P. Moyer, A. Dobbs, E. Courtney, R. Graves, Referee, Mr. G. Boss. New Zealand won the toss and a messenger kicked off. New South Wales at the beginning beat the visitors for the ball in the scrum, but they handled it badly, the high wind evidently bothering the players. McGregor ran strongly, skirting the touch line, but he passed off side to Gleeson, who got over the line. Instead of a try, the visitors were penalised. The game now became particularly fast, and at times was exciting. Messenger put in a clever fainting run, and beating opponents, he opened the way for a pass to Can, which, had it been taken, might have closed with a try. Can earned applause for following on and blocking the visiting fullback Turtle from returning, and a few minutes later a similar compliment was passed to Fry for saving. Messenger was injured when in the midst of about four forwards and had to retire for a few moments. His shoulder was hurt. Shortly before half time, Rowe secured at the centre and ran splendidly to the corner where he cut in and then passed to Todd who scored in the corner just as he was tackled by Devereux. Turtill failed at goal, New Zealand three points to nil. On resuming, Wynyard, securing in the ruck, ran through the light blues while they were looking on, and he scored a capital try. Turtill failed at goal, New Zealand six points to nil. The visitors were now playing all over the home team. Their handling of the ball was accurate, and their passing at close quarters quite nonplussed the light blues. In the course of a scramble on the home line, a light blue punted, and the wind carried the ball over the line, and when it came down, Rose secured and scored a try, which Wrigley failed to convert. The scores at half-time were New Zealand 9 points to nil. Second half. 
after the usual kick-off the blue forwards with moyer and graves at the head transferred play from centre to the visitors twenty-five and cheadle was accorded applause for getting in a capital line kick the ball going out a yard from the visitors corner back to the centre messenger broke away but lost the ball and todd securing he ran a long touch and beating fry's tackle secured a try which wrigley converted the wind caught the ball in the flight and carried it over the bar new zealand fourteen points to nil the blues tried passing the ball being handled by brown cheadle can messenger and Devereux, but not a yard was gained the game became willing too much so for a player on each side exchanged blows johnson and cross were playing a splendid game in the visiting forwards heading rush after rush with penalty kicks messenger generally found the line but it was always to no purpose for the visiting forward or the backs were soon back in the home half once brown dashed away and got to within a few yards of the visitors line where he threw back wildly and the blacks relieved a few minutes later can secured and passed to dobbs to cheadle who ran for the corner and cut in then passed to holloway who scored in the corner messenger with a magnificent kick converted the try into a goal amidst much cheering new zealand fourteen points to five in a hard burst dobbs was hurt and was carried to touch the new zealand forwards made a rush and tyler secured a try in the corner a light blue went at him and struck the corner flag the crowd thought it was tyler who did so and hooted at the referee for his decision wrigley with the wind behind him kicked a goal from the touchline and made the full-time score new zealand nineteen points two goals three tries to five one goal messenger and the all blacks negotiations are proceeding with regard to the inclusion of messenger in the new zealand team for england inquiry last night elicited the information from one of the new zealanders that messenger had not quite made up his mind having got so far it is considered that his inclusion in the team is a certainty new zealand players suspended wellington wednesday the wellington rugby union has suspended six players for participating in the professional matches in sydney end of part five part six of the birth of professional rugby league in australia selections from the sydney morning herald nineteen hundred and seven to nineteen hundred and eight this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The 1907 season ends. Rugby Union in Crisis. 23rd of August to 2nd of September, 1907. Friday, 23rd of August, 1907. Professional Rugby. New South Wales versus New Zealand. The New Zealanders have picked the following team to meet New South Wales on Saturday. Fullback, S. Turtle. Three quarters G. Smith, H. Rowe, and J. Lavery. Five eighths E. Wrigley and R. Wynyard. Halves Kelly and W. Tyler. Forwards Watkins, W. Mackerel, T. Cross, R. White, W. Johnson, W. Trevathan, and Byrne. Emergencies Gilchrist and Todd. The visitors have chosen a remarkably fine lot of forwards and with regard to the backs it will be seen that the team includes g w smith who established the australasian record for a hundred and twenty yards hurdles the side that can leave out todd after his exhibition on wednesday must be a strong one harking back to smith it will be interesting to see him facing messenger incidentally it may be mentioned that the visitors think they will put up a record score on saturday there is some doubt about Dobbs and Moyer playing in the New South Wales 15. The former received a kick on the head, and Moyer was kicked on the ankle so seriously that it is said that he will have to put it in plaster. English programme. The following representative matches have been arranged for the professional team. December 18th, Yorkshire. January 1st, Wales. January 8th, Cumberland. January 11th, England. January 18th, Lancashire. January 25th, Northern Union. 
Saturday, 24th of August, 1907. Professional Rugby. New South Wales versus New Zealand. Last big match of the season. The closing match of the season, outside the semi-finals and final of the first grade competition, will be played this afternoon and will be between New South Wales and the New Zealand professional team to visit England. The first engagement resulted in a victory for New Zealand by 12 points to 8, and the second went the same way, by 19 points to 5. The second match of the visitors showed a great improvement on the first, the result of the better understanding of one another's tactics, which makes for combination. Today's exhibition may be expected to be better still. The arrival of the remaining Aucklanders gives the selectors a wider range of choice. The scene of the contest will be the agricultural ground, and the teams are as follow. New South Wales, fullback C. Headley, three quarters J. Stunts, E. Fry, H. Messenger, A. Devereux, halves F. Cheadle, R. Holloway, forwards H. Glanville, J. Abercrombie, R. Mabel, S. Pierce, H. Can, R. Graves, H. Hamill, Brackenrig, Emergencies, Brown, Dalpuget, and Courtney. New Zealand, Fullback, S. Turtle, Canterbury, Three Quarters, G. W. Smith, Auckland, H. Rowe, Auckland, J. Lavery, Canterbury, Five Eighths, E. Wrigley, Wairarapa, R. Wynyard, Auckland, Halves, A. Kelly, Wellington, W. Tyler, Auckland, Forwards, E. Watkins, Wellington, W. Mackerel, Auckland, T. Cross, Wellington, W. Johnson, Otago, R. Wright, Wellington, W. Trevathan, Auckland, C. Byrne, Wellington, Referee, Mr. T. O'Farrell. The early match will be between Sydney and East Sydney under the Australian rules. Messenger joins New Zealand team. At length, the negotiations which have been proceeding between the New Zealand team and H. H. Messenger, the crack New South Wales three-quarter, have ended and the result is that he joins the team for england and will play as one of them share and share alike messenger is twenty-four years of age and is a native of balmain though for over twenty years he has resided almost on the beach at double bay his ability as a footballer was first recognised by one of the masters of the double bay public school mr j Molaire, and he gave him every encouragement and a lot of good advice Messenger was then about twelve or fourteen years of age. For some years he was one of the three quarters of the Warrigal Club, playing in the city and suburban competition. Then he took a spell for a year, and at the end thereof, on an invitation from Mr Fraser, Secretary of Eastern Suburbs Club, he joined that club's second grade team and helped it to win the competition in 1905. Thus, two years ago, he was playing in the second grade ranks. Now he is considered to be the finest rugby player in Australia. In 1906 he was promoted to first grade, and the same year he represented New South Wales against Queensland, and this season he played in every representative contest except the one in which Australia was beaten by New Zealand by 26 points to 6, and then he had a bad ankle. The try he got when he leaped over an opponent will be remembered for many years. Messenger will leave on Sunday night with the balance of the New Zealand team by express train to catch the Ortona at Melbourne. Seventeen are remaining behind for today's engagement. The others sail today. It is quite possible that Messenger may follow up rowing for a time in England, but he has not the slightest intention of remaining to play professional rugby there. He will return as soon as the tour is over. His friends are giving him a send-off at the Oddfellows Hall, Willara tonight. A conference. A conference was held last night at the Gresham Hotel between representatives of New South Wales and New Zealand. Those present were Messrs H. D. Hoyle, A. S. Hennessy, A. Burden, H. Messenger, J. C. Gleeson, Palmer, A. H. Baskerville, V. Trumper, and J. J. Giltonen. The business was conducted in camera. Monday, 26th of August, 1907. Professional football. New South Wales versus New Zealand. Won by New Zealand, five points to three. A good match. The third engagement between the professional all-black team to visit England and the New South Wales League 
was played in warm weather on saturday afternoon the agricultural ground where the contest took place was visited by about eight thousand people who saw a hard and at times fast game without much attempt in the way of passing rushes at half time new south wales led by a penalty goal three points to nil in the second spell thanks to a desire by messenger to force instead of catching the ball and running it out the visitors following up a penalty kick at goal secured a try which was converted into a goal and the new zealanders won an exciting game by five points to three new zealand won the toss and defended the paddington end new south wales pressed from messenger's kick-off and after play between the two twenty-fives the home team attacked a high punt in front of the visitor's goal was caught by rowe who ran back over his line where he was tackled by two light blues rowe cleared himself splendidly leaving the new south welshman sprawling on the ground and he ran and amidst cheers kicked out at the centre thrown in messenger presently took a drop kick at goal it was a magnificent effort though unsuccessful the visitors forcing the blacks got a splendid rush which extended from their twenty-five to the home line wrigley was specially prominent in this movement which should have closed with a try but for messenger saving and kicking dead to the fence new south wales were however having the better of the game and in the visitors half several free kicks were awarded against the blacks and at length messenger found the way over the bar amidst much cheering new south wales three points to nil the home forwards were showing much the better work in the loose their rushes being very fine the blacks could not handle the ball at all and the passes were not given as accurately as usual a splendid dash was however shown by the visitors and a rare struggle ensued on the home line winyard looking like getting in at length new south wales found relief in a sensational way the visitors three quarters tried passing in front of the opposing goal and Deverer intercepted and ran to the centre where he passed to brown who got to the twenty-five but a blind pass pulled up the movement in this burst there was an unrehearsed scene one of the players lost his nether garment and the two teams gathered round him while a fresh pair of pants were requisitioned the game was undoubtedly a good one and was particularly fast winyard broke away at the centre and ran to the home twenty-five where he passed to smith who was splendidly brought down by headley just before half-time the blacks showed a beautiful succession of passes the ball being handled by the halves and three-quarters ground being gained each time until the corner was reached where on the line kelly was held up and from the scrum new south wales relieved half-time scores new south wales three points to nil second half the second spell opened with a hard attack by the blacks and for a time the blues had their work cut out to keep the visitors back the black forwards were playing a great game and the home team were also making the pace a cracker still there was little combination amongst the backs long punts were one of the features of the game headley was playing in capital style after a period of defence the blues using the line got into the visitors territory messenger's line kick driving them to their twenty-five play between the two twenty-fives occupied attention the centre figure of the play being always messenger new south wales were awarded a free for illegal interference on the line out and going back to the centre line messenger kicked for goal and the effort was blocked the game was willing much too willing a black on one occasion dumped a blue on the ground the new zealanders made the score five to three in a remarkable way they had a free kick in the home twenty-five and the ball was allowed by messenger to go to ground in the hope of a force but instead of the ball going onwards it bounced back and before the home three-quarter could recover johnson came down on the ground secured possession and fell over the line and the try was converted into a goal within five minutes the blacks were again kicking for a goal a penalty for offside in the scrum but nothing resulted a lot of lines out and scrums reduced the value of the game as an exhibition of rugby from a spectator's point of view glanville took a mark inside the visitors half and a messenger made a good though unsuccessful effort at goal new zealand forcing the main point about the game was the excellent line kicking on both sides 
messenger presently had another kick at goal this time from a mark by himself and was unsuccessful the whistle sounded on a win for new zealand by five points to three presentation to messenger h messenger who has joined the new zealand team was on saturday night at woolara made the recipient of two purses of sovereigns a large number of residents of double bay where the popular footballer has his home and of the eastern suburbs generally met to offer their congratulations to him mr mclaughlin occupied the chair and in handing messenger the token of esteem from the residents referred to the guest's brilliant career as an exponent of the rugby game many of the new zealanders as well as prominent local players were also present some of whom endorsed the chairman's remarks the second presentation was made by mr giltonen on behalf of the new south wales rugby football league departure of new zealand team the new zealand team left by express train last night for melbourne where they will catch the ortona for england they were accorded a send-off by about two hundred people cheers and war cries were given as the train left the station thursday twenty ninth of august nineteen hundred and seven new south wales rugby football league a meeting of the committee of the above was held last night at batesman's crystal hotel the press was not admitted it was however gathered that the players who took part in the three recent matches have intimated that they are prepared to forgo any claims for remuneration preferring to allow their shares to go towards the establishment of a fund on a sound basis messrs boss and o'farrell were made life members of the league they refereed the three matches against the new zealand professional team a referees association formed a meeting to form a referees association in connection with the new south wales rugby football league was held at bateman's crystal hotel last night mr e hooper was in the chair mr t o farrell was elected secretary pro tem amongst those present were messrs g boss w oberg p a stanton h johnson w h woodhill h odbert g hay g seabrook and p rohan the rules of the new south wales rugby union referees association were adopted with increased remunerations those who join the association will be guaranteed engagement every saturday either as a referee or linesman mr t o farrell was appointed on secretary and mr p a stanton treasurer mr g boss was elected representative on the league the new rugby meeting of metropolitan union motions out of order a special general meeting of the metropolitan rugby union mr h d wood presiding was held last night to discuss the following resolutions of which mr l g abrams had given notice one that any playing member of a first grade club affiliated to this union representing the state or the union shall be allowed upon the production of a certificate from his employer his loss of wages during such time he shall be absent from his employment which shall not exceed ten shillings per day two should an accident occur to any first grade player either in an interstate or a competition match which necessitates his being unable to follow his occupation he shall upon the production of a certificate signed by a duly qualified medical man stating that from such accident he is unable to resume his work be allowed his loss of wages until such time as the medical adviser certifies that he is able to resume his work three that any playing member of a first grade club affiliated to this union representing either the state or this union shall be allowed the sum of five shillings per day for personal or out-of-pocket expenses in addition to his loss of wages the chairman said it was his duty as president to rule the motion out of order he did so at that stage because if he allowed discussion a point of order would be taken or if it was not it would be his duty to state what his opinion was on the subject the result would be that considerable time would be wasted the resolution was not merely an expression of opinion because it decided that any playing member of a first grade club should be allowed his loss of wages that was clearly a direction it would also mean amending the rules dealing with professionalism which could only be dealt with by another union mr green asked if there was any way in which the amendments could be discussed 
the chairman agreed that the matter was of such importance that it would have to be dealt with in the proper way at an early date mr abrams moved to dissent from the chairman's ruling the union he contended was quite in order in discussing the motion he denied that his trend was towards professionalism it was a matter of such vital importance that until someone took a point of order discussion should be allowed so that the public and the players could see that they wanted to do what was right they were face to face with the greatest crisis in australian rugby mr clayton explained why he had seconded the motions mr clayton said he agreed with the speaker's ideas as to a fair allowance being made for loss of wages such for instance as the cricket association granted while he was of opinion that a man should not play for gain he should certainly not suffer loss under those conditions he had agreed to second mr abrams motion mr abrams none of you fellows would take it up mr clayton quite agreed with the chairman's ruling it was no use however trying to bluff the players if they were going to make an allowance they must have a conference with the other states and new zealand or it might result in their not being recognised his idea was that they should then go to the english rugby union and get them to recognise australian conditions hear hear he was sorry some members of the club he represented had broken away he was certain if they had understood all the circumstances they would not have done so but he was convinced the unions would have to make good the losses which players incurred both the public and the players demanded it mr abrams i told you four years ago that it would have to be done had any one else brought the matter forward it would have been all right cries of order the chairman took exception to mr abrams remark it could only be directed at him mr abrams assured the chairman he had no intention of imputing anything improper to him the motion to dissent from the chairman's ruling was lost monday second of september nineteen hundred and seven review of rugby season first grade competition new zealand matches the rift in the lute by the final match in the first grade competition on saturday important football for nineteen hundred and seven concluded when glebe defeated university for the premiership next season we shall be preparing for dispatching a team to england for nineteen hundred and eight season the curtain has fallen upon the most remarkable year in the history of rugby football in australia and there have been across the tasman sea enough happenings to cause nineteen hundred and seven to be well remembered the evenness of club teams and the prospect of the all blacks visit had their effect even in the preliminary engagements in view of such popularity there is no fear of rugby ceasing to be the national football game of new south wales three contests from one saturday to the following saturday attracted a hundred and twenty three thousand people to the sydney cricket ground no one could possibly find fault with the first grade competition despite the plethora of big football club matches attracted large crowds and saturday's twenty thousand was a fitting wind-up to an extraordinary season a casual glance through each saturday's results will furnish quite sufficient evidence that things which are equal to the same are equal to one another does not apply to sport and especially football a was too good for b and b for c but c would beat a out of sight this is what happened through the whole of the season there is one instance in particular university beat glebe by thirteen to nil in the preliminary round in the final glebe beat university by thirteen points to nil between club and club honours are easy glebe have won the premiership the final victory which gives them the championship being thoroughly deserved they rose to the occasion and played perhaps the game of their lives the usually brilliant alma mater representatives gave few instances and then when too late of that combination which has made them famous glebe's showing on saturday was so far ahead of previous displays that one could scarcely believe they were the same team glebe's season has been a peculiar one in some cases they were decidedly lucky to win and strange to say those matches were against the weakest in the competition manly have secured the wooden spoon yet glebe defeated them by no more than nine points to eight st george the runners-up for that doubtful distinction lost to glebe by five to three though the illawarra suburbanites played the better game 
glebe were quite satisfied to win without establishing big figures they just scraped home on many occasions when they got in front they were content to hold their advantage and the effect of this is shown in the fact that after thirteen matches their credit balance in points is but thirty-nine on the other hand university with three defeats and a drawn game to glebe's two defeats have a credit balance of ninety-one actually within ten of glebe's aggregate points for the season glebe's score twice ran into double figures university did so on nine occasions eastern suburbs showed out promisingly thanks to having on their side the most versatile player in australia messenger after having made a splendid showing right up to the closing stages of the competition they received a blow from the professional movement which left them staggering nevertheless they found recruits who with seven or eight of their former first grade side played glebe so good a game in the semi-final as to be defeated only by three points to nil south sydney had an in and out season and considering the weakness of sydney in the back division that team showed at times fine form especially when they defeated university by six to three st george were unfortunate in losing judd whose leg was broken in the first queensland contest the district of balmain is torn by contending football interests it actually supports teams in rugby the australian game and in soccer and in view of so heavy a drain upon the football youth of the suburb the first grade rugby team have done not at all badly before passing away from the first grade competition reference should be made to an incident at the close of saturday's final which sent a glow of pleasure coursing through the veins of the spectators time was when the cricket and football grounds were in reality tented fields and not surrounded by piles of buildings such as adorn the sydney cricket ground the enthusiasm of the crowd would reach such a height that a section would break through the boundaries and carry shoulder high the man who had played the most important part in winning for his side the presence of the cold-blooded police have been responsible for the get up and go straight home tendency which now exists but on saturday this was broken through a couple of supporters of the glebe club got on to the ground and shouldered high conlon the captain of the victorious team and the crowd looked on beamingly cheering and cheering again the victor and the vanquished was not forgotten saturday's incident recalls a personal recollection of something similar which while there was a possibility of a fatal ending had a decidedly humorous side it was at the finish of the eighteen eighty cricket match between new south wales and victoria at melbourne victoria had to get forty or fifty runs and there were but two wickets to fall the game as far as victoria was concerned was apparently all over bar shouting assistance however came from an unexpected quarter frank allen known as the bowler of a century and elliot the wicket-keeper were together they were not thought to be able to stand for any length of time but the chances of the game were shown the two won the match the crowd rushed the ground and soon had allen and elliot in their grip the former lost consciousness and it was some time before he was brought round now comes the sequel some years afterwards the writer in referring to allen wrote that he was so delicate that he fainted after having helped to win a great victorian victory on seeing this mr allen wrote in explanation he stated it was not because of delicate health he collapsed but because one of the crowd more enthusiastic than the rest had him by the throat and was strangling him next day wrote mr allen i was dining at paris in burke street and a gentleman a stranger sitting at the same table offered his congratulations upon the previous day's win and asked how did i like being carried off the ground into the pavilion i replied i did not like it at all for one man in the excess of enthusiasm had me by the throat and all but strangled me at this the stranger jumped to his feet threw out his bosom smote his chest and his face glowing with pride exclaimed that was i i informed him continued mr allen that unless he wished to be called upon to answer a charge of manslaughter not to carry a man that way again harking back to the football season the results of all big engagements have the effect of placing new south wales ahead of queensland and on a par with new zealand if the result of the games with the all blacks one win each and a drawn game 
is to be accepted as the outcome of improvement amongst the New South Welshmen, then there is occasion for congratulation. Indeed, looking no farther than actual results, there is satisfaction in the fact that New South Wales played such good games with New Zealand. But whether honours easy is due to improvement in the home side, or a deterioration in the visitors is not quite clear. The form shown by the New Zealanders, except on one or two occasions, was not what previous teams have shown. They themselves claim to be quite as good as the combination which visited Australia in 1903, but upon that point there is considerable doubt. The success of New South Wales following upon the series of triumphs by the All Blacks in Great Britain is responsible for the hope that the team for England next year will acquit themselves creditably. The close of the season has been marked in New Zealand and New South Wales by a step which strikes a big blow at amateurism. A professional New Zealand team are now on their way to the north of England, a league having for its object recompense for loss of time, which is not allowed under the New South Wales Rugby Union, has been formed in New South Wales. During the summer, this body will no doubt work hard to place itself on a sound footing. As to how far it will succeed, only time can tell. That there are hardships upon players under the constitution of the old unions is admitted even by those who stick for out-and-out -out amateurism. The professional movement, whether it be successful or not, will apparently have the effect of improving the case of representative players. It has stirred leading members of the governing bodies to action, but those who are responsible will suffer the usual martyrdom. They will probably be disqualified for life. End of part six. Part 7 of The Birth of Professional Rugby League in Australia Selections from the Sydney Morning Herald, 1907-1908 This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. News from England, The All Blacks Tour 13th of September, 1907 to 10th of January, 1908 Friday, 13th of September, 1907 Professional Rugby. Players disqualified. At Wednesday night's meeting of the Metropolitan Rugby Union, all the players who took part in the matches against the New Zealand professional team were disqualified, and also the Marrickville team, which played the early match, in one of the engagements. These players cannot play with any club affiliated to the Metropolitan Union. They are not disqualified for life or for any term but simply disqualified. The removal of these disqualifications can only be effected through the English Rugby Union. The names of those first-grade players who have incurred the above penalty are C. Headley, E. Fry, F. Cheadle, Brown, H. Messenger, A. Devereux, J. Stunts, L. Dalpuget, A. Holloway, H. Pierce, W. Can, H. Glanville, J. Abercrombie, H. Hamill, H. Brackenrig, R. Mabel, R. Graves, A. S. Hennessy, P. Moyer, A. Dobbs, E. Courtney, A. Rosenfelt. The Committee of the Metropolitan Union held an inquiry which extended over two nights and gave every player an opportunity to show cause. Monday, 16th of September, 1907. Football, Rugby, St. George Club. Mr. Carruthers on Professionalism. At a meeting of the St. George Football Club, Mr. J. H. Clayton presiding, on the motion of Mr. W. Logan, a vote of confidence in the Metropolitan Rugby Union was carried. The Premier, Mr. Carruthers, wrote stating that he was not in favour of professionalism, but he thought the men ought to get their out-of-pocket expenses. He strongly advised the lads to stick to pure amateurism. Mr. H. D. Wood, and Mr. J. McMahon were also present, and delivered short addresses. Wednesday, 25th of September, 1907. Football Dinner. The annual dinner of the Manly District Football Club took place on 21st inst. The chairman, Alderman E. W. Quirk, referred to the newly formed Football League. As far as the Manly Club was concerned, professionalism would not be tolerated. 
mr adam ogilvy responded he felt certain the manly club would always remain loyal to the rugby union and never associate with professionalism he thanked the new south wales union and metropolitan union for the treatment meted out to the manly club during the past season saturday fifth of october nineteen hundred and seven rugby in the north of england in the course of a letter from mr alexander manchester to his brother mr w a alexander vice-president of the new south wales amateur athletic association the game played by the professionals in the north of england is thus described the northern union teams play thirteen men aside the placings are as follows one full-back four three-quarter backs two half-backs six forwards the men play the ball game that is when a man is held no scrimmage takes place but no matter in what position that man is on his back head or anywhere else he has to kick the ball to put it in play again this is not always an easy matter for him nor a very gentle process either then there is no throw-in from touch the ball is scrimmaged among the men five yards from the line thus no advantage results from the ceaseless kicking out of bounds pursued by the players of the amateur union's game if you can understand the above short description of the chief features of the game you will readily see that the ball is always in play big fat beefy beer-barrelled forwards are no use now at this game they have to be fast so the new zealanders will have to put forward their best efforts to win also they will find the professionals a very different lot to those the amateur clubs met during their previous and last visits twenty sixth of october nineteen hundred and seven sport in england from our special correspondent football london september the twentieth the football season opened on saturday last and all over england the grounds were crowded with spectators it is not generally known in australia how comparatively small a part rugby plays here i attended the most important rugby fixture of the day and found it witnessed by some three thousand spectators in many places throughout england the newspapers recorded attendances of thirty thousand for the british association game and ten to fifteen thousand was quite the ordinary attendance football organization here is of considerable interest especially in view of the news of alarms and excursions that has reached us this week from sydney the association game is very largely a professional business and competition games are played every day the amateur element of the association has this year broken away from the parent authority and a new amateur association has been successfully launched in the case of rugby the professional element is confined to the teams of the northern union chiefly yorkshire clubs and so keenly is amateurism in favour among all other governing bodies of england wales scotland and ireland that the powerful welsh union has been unanimously applauded for its drastic action of last week by which several clubs and some individual players were incontinently disqualified and expelled for conduct that savoured of professionalism wales is amateur to a man a fact which is all the more significant because the great majority of the players are of the working class and could easily better themselves financially by joining the professional ranks little interest is evinced here in the forthcoming professional tour of the new zealand team some strange statements concerning the team's doings in australia have been appearing in the london press and it is apparent that the men are expected to be identical with those of the all blacks recently in sydney some surprise and possibly disappointment would thus appear to be in store for those who are thus anticipating in any case in view of the very limited area to which professional rugby is confined here it will be advisable for the new south wales newly organised professionals to be very sure of their ground before embarking upon their suggested tour of the north of england next year friday fifteenth of november nineteen hundred and seven professional all blacks opening match messenger in brilliant form files by the english mail contain reports of the first match of their english tour played by the professional all black team against bramley whom they defeated by twenty five points to six rugby enthusiasts here will be pleased to learn that messenger registered the first score of the tour by kicking a penalty goal and also got the first try which he converted altogether he kicked five goals 
tries were also scored by tyler too smith and wrigley in its comments on the match the london sportsman said it is to be presumed that the team chosen by the new zealanders for the opening match represented what would be called their best side it included four of the original all black team g w smith d mcgregor w mackerel and w johnson and in addition the australian crack h h messenger was included bramley relied purely upon their club team and in the first half of the match came out of the ordeal with very considerable credit at half time the home side had really had the better of the game and but for messenger's brilliant goal kicking the all blacks would not have been ahead at that period as it was they only claimed a four-point lead at the interval the result of two goals kicked by messenger each side had also scored two tries in this latter connection it is worth recalling the fact that when the original all blacks were here two years ago a goal was scored in their opening match but several weeks elapsed before their line had been crossed yesterday in the present team's opening game sedgwick a squarely built right wing three-quarter got through their defence twice and on each occasion moreover did so rather easily in the first part of the game the all blacks adopted the policy of playing five forwards against six with tyler as an outside man these tactics did not pay at all if one may judge from the frequency with which bramley got possession of the ball in the second half tyler went more frequently into the pack and some rather better scrummaging was seen it is perhaps difficult or it might be even unfair to form a comparison of the all-round capabilities of the present combination as compared with their predecessors from new zealand the conditions are different not only in the rules which bristle with technicalities but also in the reduction of the forwards from eight to six there is no doubt that this reduction by restricting cohesive movements in the scrummage tends to lessen the openings for organised attacks by the backs such as rugby men are accustomed to in the orthodox code and such as we saw from gallagher's famous team two years ago in this sense comparison is as we have said difficult and may even be misleading there is one point however upon which an opinion can be expressed without hesitation and that is that on the form of the all blacks yesterday they are as a body not so fast as the original team while their passing was nothing like so polished or frequent only one really fine round of passing was seen yesterday and even then the finishing touch was wanting smith seems to have lost none of his pace and he and messenger received considerable attention from their opponents yesterday as they probably will do in many of their remaining matches thursday thirty first of october nineteen hundred and seven rugby league financial matters the new south wales rugby football league has at length completed its constitution most of the clauses are just what would be drawn up for the control of any athletic body the most important clauses are those controlling the finances of the league and the clubs some of them are all metropolitan district clubs playing competition matches to receive after paying ground percentage and wages thirty three and a third per cent of the net proceeds and the league to receive thirty three and a third per cent the league to pay all advertisements and referees fees this only applies to first grade matches excepting the final match of the first grade competition the final match of first grade competition thirty three and a third per cent of the net proceeds to be devoted to the hospitals and the balance to the assurance fund any member hurt and incapacitated and prevented from following his usual occupation shall receive all medical aid medicine and two pounds per week until fit to follow his usual occupation the maximum time for receiving benefit shall be sixteen weeks should any player be permanently injured the matter may be brought before the committee and such steps may be taken as the circumstances warrant district clubs shall supply playing members with uniforms free of cost any player playing interstate or international matches in the commonwealth and the dominion of new zealand under the direction of the new south wales r f l will receive seven shillings and sixpence per day for personal expenses outside the state and five shillings per day within the state and may receive ten shillings per day sundays not included for loss of time or salary 
in international matches beyond the commonwealth of australia and the dominion of new zealand on the termination of the tour the surplus if any after defraying all expenses such as steam affairs railway fares hotel account meaning board and residence football costumes shall be divided between the new south wales rugby football league and each member of the team including the manager any playing member of any club playing metropolitan district football under the direction of the new south wales league will be reimbursed for his actual loss of time while playing football only payment not to exceed ten shillings per day and such payment to be made by his club thursday fifth of december nineteen hundred and seven new zealand footballers a candid critic london december the third the time says the new zealand professional footballers have not been careful to keep in good condition and that the financial success of the tour seems to have demoralised some of them the newspaper expresses the opinion that it is highly probable a majority of members of the team will accept engagements with teams of the northern rugby union monday twenty third of december nineteen hundred and seven professional rugby australian team for england leaves in august it was cabled recently from london that the times had stated that the financial success of the tour of the new zealand footballers was demoralising some of the members of the team since that message was received private letters and cables have been received in new zealand and sydney in support of the statement regarding the remarkable support the undertaking was receiving from the people of the north of england it was thought when the team left that as its operations would be limited to a comparatively small portion of england the public would get tired of seeing it play and as a consequence the undertaking would probably end in failure quite the reverse has happened the financial outcome is quite beyond the anticipations even of the promoters such a report must strike a heavy blow at amateur rugby in australia and new zealand perhaps in england and south africa towards the end of last season the new south wales rugby football league was formed and the secretary mr j j giltonen early in the movement entered into correspondence with mr j platt secretary of the english northern rugby union and raised hopes that a new south wales team would visit england next football season apparently it required only a successful issue of the present tour to settle the matter on saturday mr giltonen received a cable message from mr platt inviting the new south wales league team to visit england during the english nineteen hundred and eight season under similar conditions to the present all blacks tour prior to the departure of the new zealanders the english northern union lodged three thousand pound as a guarantee to cover expenses and in addition the team was to receive seventy per cent of the takings each member of the team put in fifty pounds those who did not have it were charged twenty per cent for the loan of it the interest going into the general account the constitution recently drawn up by the new south wales league covers undertakings such as that proposed for next season in view of the invitation from england it is intended to send an australian team in the coming august a month later the new south wales rugby union will send a combination to england under the invitation of the english rugby union in view of the fact that the tour through the north of england has resulted so well from a pecuniary point of view it is possible the new south wales organisers will get together a strong team though one perhaps not representative of australia the prospect of a trip with a substantial check at the finish is a bait many may be prepared to accept footballers will have the option of going with one team as professionals or with another as amateurs there is however a possible consequence of the clash of the two teams which cannot be overlooked the famous m c c would not send a cricket eleven to australia last year because of the trouble then existing among the board of control the melbourne club and the leading players the english rugby union may take a similar view and advise the postponement of the visit of the team of the new south wales union looking at the matter fairly and squarely the professional movement is a serious menace to amateur football the fear of failure kept some of the leading new zealanders from joining the trip to england now its possibilities of profit are known the next new zealand professional combination will be much stronger the australian team will probably be chosen in july 
Tuesday, 24th of December, 1907. Amateur Rugby, the English Tour. In the opinion of several officials of the New South Wales Rugby Union, the proposed visit of a professional team to the north of England will not in any way affect the amateur team invited by the English Rugby Union to tour Great Britain. The New South Wales Union is satisfied that all the leading players of last season will remain loyal to the governing body. The team to visit England will leave in August or September and will be chosen about July. It is not yet decided whether the combination will be New South Wales or Australian. The Council is considering the question of increased allowances to players. The New South Wales Rugby Union expects shortly to hear what the programme of fixtures for the tour is. A conference was recently held by representatives of the English, Scottish, Irish and Welsh unions, and Mr J. H. S. MacArthur, the representative of the New South Wales Rugby Union, was present. The programme of matches is expected to be the outcome of such conference. Wednesday, 25th of December, 1907. Amateur Rugby. Trip to England assured. Increased allowances. Following upon the receipt of cable messages that a professional team would visit England and that the English Rugby Union had decided to dispatch a team to New Zealand, came yesterday afternoon the news by cable to Mr W. W. Hill, Secretary of the New South Wales Rugby Union, that England and Wales had approved the tour in 1908 throughout Great Britain of a New South Wales or an Australian team. Ireland and Scotland, it is understood, had already decided in favour of the tour. It was stated in yesterday's issue that a conference between representatives of the British unions was being held, and a cabled communication was shortly expected. It was also stated that the New South Wales team was confident the tour would take place. The cable message received by Mr Hill sets all doubt at rest. The Secretary of the New South Wales Rugby Union is of the opinion that the team will come back via America, and probably receive increased allowances. Naturally, the rugby union officials are highly pleased over the receipt of the information that the trip is assured, especially in view of the fact that an Australian professional combination has been invited to tour the north of England in the same year. It is possible that the British combination to visit New Zealand in April will come to Australia and play a few matches, and the British and Australian or New South Wales teams, as the case may be, will travel to England together. Friday, 3rd of January, 1908. Rugby football. Wales defeats New Zealand. London, January the 1st. Wales, three tries, nine points, defeated the New Zealand professional football team. One goal, two tries, eight points today. The New Zealanders led at half-time by eight points to three. There was an exciting struggle in the second half. Wales obtaining the winning try just on time. The Scottish Rugby Union does not support the trip of a British team to New Zealand on the ground that it is likely, indirectly, to strengthen the professional movement. Friday, 10th of January, 1908. New Zealand footballers defeated by Cumberland. London, January the 8th. Cumberland scored three goals, five tries against the New Zealand professional rugby football teams, three goals, one try. Cumberland pressed the game during all the first half, scoring 15 points to nil. End of part seven. Part eight of the birth of professional rugby league in Australia. Selections from the Sydney Morning Herald. 1907 to 1908. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. New clubs formed. 10th of January to 11th of February, 1908. Friday, 10th of January, 1908. Rugby League. Enthusiastic meeting. New club at Glebe. A largely attended meeting of the New South Wales Rugby Football League was held in the Glebe Town Hall last evening. The Mayor, Alderman Lucas, presided, and among those on the platform were Messrs H. Hoyle, President, Knox, Vice-President, J. Giltinen, Secretary, G. Boss, and H. Oddbird, Referees Association, A. Burden, C. Headley, P. Moyer, V. Harris, J. Conlon, Glebe, 
a mcnamara and a waymark joint secretaries of the glebe club t j mccabe lancashire g hamill f cheadle newtown a hennessy s fry south sydney and a dobbs balmain the chairman said that the more opportunities given to young men in open field sports the more likelihood there was of their being made into good citizens and fathers football was a manly sport when properly carried out and taught young men to conduct themselves in conditions of great excitement in a cool and collected manner he was not going to say anything about amateurism or professionalism he would leave those points to men who knew more about the technicalities of the game and were thus better able to advise the course they should adopt applause mr h hoyle said it was remarkable that a section of the press more particularly the so-called sporting section had shown a most unreasonable antagonism to men who tried to introduce something new and better in existing conditions those present had seen what the new south wales rugby football league officials had been doing and the hearty response in numbers was a reply direct enough to show their confidence in the league and their willingness to go on with the movement the league was formed because it was believed that the set of conditions controlling the football union were not suitable to the democracy and social conditions of the australian people did they propose professionalism certainly not the idea was absolutely absurd the officials proposed that the men should play the game without loss to themselves and in a manner that would make it better and more brilliant than ever if any of the men lost their time the gates that they would draw as footballers would have to make up their wages applause if they were hurt whilst playing they would receive two pound a week for sixteen weeks with free doctor and medicine until they had recovered there was nothing wrong about that the money obtained at the gates would be used to perfect football the gate money would be disposed of in the following way after paying the ground fees and other expenses the balance would be dispersed by giving both the clubs and the controlling body thirty three and one third per cent each it was proposed to not only treat the players as men but when they were going away to another state they would be able to maintain their dignity by having money in their pockets for expenses at the rate of five shillings and in some cases seven shillings and sixpence a day as well as being paid up to ten shillings a day for loss of wages he knew of many players who had gone to queensland and had paid away the three shillings allowed by the rugby union in one shout they must remember that they could not take a drink if they were worthy of the name of men without reciprocating mr giltonan displayed a cablegram he had received from england which he stated was an invitation for an australian team to visit that country the sum of seven thousand pounds was in the bank there as a guarantee and the new south wales rugby union would receive seventy per cent of the gate money applause it was resolved to form a glebe district football club to be affiliated with the new south wales football league the following were elected as office bearers patron mr w m hughes m p president alderman p c lucas mayor vice presidents alderman l l earl messrs a buckle r burden and j sheeran acting on secretaries messrs a waymark and a l h mcnamara acting treasurer mr r burden provisional committee messrs f burke p coleman v harris a burden p moyer h griffiths l edwards c headley t j mccabe amid a scene of great enthusiasm j conlon signed the roll as the first member of the new club and nearly all those present followed suit wednesday fifteenth of january nineteen hundred and eight rugby football is the union backing down better treatment for players at a meeting of the council of the new south wales rugby union on monday night it was resolved that in addition to the acts of professionalism as provided for in the union's handbook the union hereby declares as an act of professionalism the holding of any office or assisting in any manner whatsoever any rugby football association declared by this union to be formed in opposition to the new south wales rugby union in the state of new south wales another matter discussed was the treatment of representative players it was decided that steps should be taken to insert in the by-laws of the union a by-law providing for the granting of allowances to players representing the state 
who have been incapacitated by being injured in the field of play and for defraying medical and other expenses caused through such injury although there has not been a by-law to that effect it might be mentioned that the union has always adopted that course and players injured while playing for the state have never lacked medical or other necessary treatment it has been thought advisable by the council however to make the point perfectly clear by including it in the by-laws it has been decided that admission tickets should be issued to all players who have represented the union to allow them to witness all representative games played locally by the union the union has been desirous for some time past of allowing increased expenses to players representing the state and the matter has been the subject of correspondence between the english rugby union and the local body the council hoped to have the necessary approval within the course of a few weeks the league new club at newtown a largely attended meeting convened by the new south wales rugby football league was held last evening in the newtown town hall the president mr h hoyle occupied the chair and amongst those present on the platform were messrs j j giltonen secretary m c hamill v cheadle w noble g ross f henlon newtown w can e fry a hennessy south sydney p moyer l edwards glebe t costello a one-time australian captain and w j ellis the chairman enumerated the many advantages that the officials would confer upon those who played under the auspices of the league out-of-pocket expenses would be allowed to competitors engaged in football while those who had the misfortune to sustain injury would receive free medical attention mr j j gilton and secretary in the course of an excessively long speech outlined the constitution of the league it was unanimously resolved to form a club in newtown to be affiliated with the new south wales rugby football league many of those present signed the roll as members of the new body the following were elected as office bearers patron dr chen hall president mayor of newtown alderman h t morgan vice presidents messrs a bakewell a murray a f desborough george linden r rogers e newman p lynch a lang j boss and edwards committee messrs j edwards walker h c hamill f cheadle c manton r s griffiths h powell f henlon and g gross secretary mr j j giltonen assistant secretary mr w noble treasurer mr g boss saturday eighteenth of january nineteen hundred and eight football rugby league new club at redfern the work of organization which the officials of the new south wales rugby league commenced in the glebe town hall continues to meet with success strong clubs have been formed at glebe and newtown another meeting was held in the redfern town hall last night when the building was packed many being unable to gain admission the chairman mr h hoyle outlined the many disadvantages that players now laboured under under the new league the players would receive every consideration and have direct representation on the central committee mr j j gilton and secretary mentioned that some very valuable trophies had been promised on the motion of mr a hennessy seconded by mr w can it was unanimously decided to form a south sydney district club to be affiliated with the new south wales rugby league the following were elected as office bearers patron mr j c watson m p president mr h hoyle vice presidents messrs peacock w c white perry brackenrig dr f w langton and j fitzgibbon representative on the league committee mr a s hennessy joint on secretaries messrs f peters and p fallon on treasurer mr george ball committee messrs w can e fry j cochran j davis and c hill many of those present became members of the new club monday twenty seventh of january nineteen hundred and eight football new south wales league eastern suburbs club formed a club affiliated with the new south wales rugby football league to represent the eastern suburbs was formed on friday night the chair was occupied by mr h doyle president 
while on the platform were several players who represented the eastern suburbs in first grade matches last season the chairman explained the objects of the league and the reasons which brought it into being mr j j giltinan secretary of the league also spoke referring to the term professionalism it was pointed out that the new body strongly protested against it as applied to them professionalism could not exist in new south wales neither was there a necessity for it financially the league had nothing to fear it had a bank guarantee of three thousand pounds for expenses and seventy per cent of the gross gate takings offered by the northern union for the visiting league's team the officers elected were patron lieutenant colonel onslow m l a president mr albert pointing vice presidents messrs james white james lawrence j v wadsworth w weeks w austin j jagelman on secretary mr h flegg on treasurer mr e hooper committee messrs v trumper e white j stunts r mabel w leslie j thompson s pierce m frawley a rosenfeld n rosenfeld f brennan and f dalpuget league versus union meeting at balmain a meeting was held in the balmain town hall on thursday night for the purpose of forming a rugby football club to affiliate with the new south wales league mr j storey m l a occupied the chair and there was a large attendance the chairman said that balmain had not received justice in regard to football and that the players had been slighted by the union football had been partly ruined in balmain by the absence of local games the outcome of the action of the union birchgrove park was one of the finest grounds in australia and he saw no necessity for the games being taken away from the local centre as they had been mr h davis considered that the manner in which the union had treated balmain in the past was such as to cause the players to welcome the new league with open arms mr h hoyle had no doubt as to the success of the new movement the league's desire was to deal out equity in two years there would be no rugby union applause the sole object of the league was to keep the game clean mr j gilton and moved that we form a club to affiliate with the new south wales league mr h hutchison seconded the motion which was carried unanimously the election of officers resulted as follows president mr cecil turner vice president messrs j m gibb t mccabe e mclaren e mcclymont w stewart e napier d murphy g holmes d duff secretary mr h davis treasurer mr r hutchison a provisional committee of five was also appointed tuesday the eleventh of february nineteen hundred and eight football new south wales rugby football league a meeting was held on friday night at the north sydney school of arts by the above league with a view to forming a football club at north sydney to affiliate with the league mr e m clark m l a presided and there was a large attendance amongst those present being messrs j j gilton and on secretary and h c hoyle an official of the league many district footballers and others interested in the movement on the motion of mr h glanville seconded by mr s murray it was decided to form a club to be known as the north sydney district football club to become affiliated with the new south wales rugby football league the following officers were elected patron mr e m clark m l a president mr j Fernelli, vice presidents messrs e blue p friend c dunn e w dunn c ford and dr mckinnon on secretary mr w hedge on treasurer mr h glanville committees messrs j abercrombie j devereux e boland w hunt j osborne and s dean by the formation of the club not more than five of the first grade players of the north sydney d f c affiliated with the metropolitan rugby union of last year will be lost but amongst the members of the new club will be a large number of second grade borough and junior players of the district messrs j j gilton and h c hoyle addressed the meeting and it was pointed out what the league proposed to do to give one-third of the gate to each competing club 
and retain one-third for the league to be used as a kind of insurance fund to provide for injured players and for their loss of time a good deal had been said about amateur and professional players but the league considered that the only difference was that the league intended to treat its members more liberally than the union had in the past so far as the club itself was concerned provision would be made whereby each member of an affiliated club would be provided with uniforms free of cost the first grade players under the union of last year who have joined the new club are messrs abercrombie glanville devereux coote and hunt end of part eight